Here we go. It's Comics of Grey, the visual storytelling show, recorded live every Wednesday. Uh, well, almost every Wednesday. I missed last week. I was sick. Sorry, everybody. Uh, at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the corner of 5th and William. Uh, this is a show where we get a bunch of interesting people involved in the comics industry or in the creative arts industry and talk about uh, why visual storytelling is so neat and uh, what kinds of uh, intellectual concepts we can plumb to be better storytellers, better educators, and better people all around. And my name is Jersey Droz. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist. And with me today, I got two really, really awesome people uh, who I'm super excited to talk about. Uh, to my right is Mr. Matt Fizell, a, uh, a Michigan institution, practically, uh, from, from Hamtramck, Detroit, right? Matt yep. Fizell. Based uh, in Hamtramck. Of uh, what, what? What's the site that we should tell people about? Cynicalman.com. Uh, www. The <laughs> cynicalman.com. <laughs> <laughs> How long have you been doing Cynical Man now? I started in the Carter administration back in 1980. <laughs> wow! <Is> so, <laughs> there's a blast from the past. I brought along the original art from Cynical Man number one. Wow! I actually drew it in printer spreads. With that's cut. a holy relic right there. Hand lettered. Cut and paste. Did you use those glue machines to do that back then? No, it was rubber cement. Uh, okay, okay. I remember those days. If I made a mistake, I just crossed it out. Yeah. It just was like totally punk. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I used to work at a newspaper back in the 90s just before they did the switch to digital. And I remember they used to have the waxing machines. Oh, like those yeah. hot rollers that you ran paper yeah, through. Sure. And, yeah, those are super cool, except you'd burn your fingers all the time on that thing. I still love that smell. <laughs> yeah, of the wax? Yeah, yeah, it really just takes me back. All those, all the chemicals that you use in the old paste-up days. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> That's why, probably why we're so weird now. And on the screen, on the Skype, we have Matt Madden of uh, Drawing Words and Writing Pictures, dw-wp.com, right? Mm -hmm. And also uh, just plain old mattmadden.com. Uh, has a, is a fairly dead site right now. I'm going to revamp it in sometime soon, but it takes you to my blog where I do my you know, post stuff pretty frequently. That's actually uh, mattmadden.blogspot.com, right? Yes, exactly. I think you've, that's what it is. you've been posting some pretty interesting stuff on there. Uh, in exper well, we're going to talk about experimental comics a lot today, I'm sure. But uh, oh, what was that? What was the latest uh, series that you've been posting with the different panel sequences? I, I had it written down someplace, but uh, that's that's a new series I'm doing called the Woods Transmissions. Yeah, uh, that's kind of a uh, it's sort of a uh, sort of creative exercise. And I'm not really you know sort of see where it goes, but the idea is that every once in a while I will draw a new uh, a panel. Uh, that's usually swiped from some other source. Um, uh, the, the Woods is a reference to Wally Woods and the, his 22 panels that, that always work. Um, and I'm planning to you know, incorporate a couple of those uh, classic compositions in there. But the idea is to take a single uh, panel at a time and add it to the panels I already have accumulated and try and rearrange them uh, as if I was you know, a, uh, a kind of a CIA operative uh, shuffling through evidence to try and find some kind of narrative meaning in, in the, uh, the evidence at hand. So uh, it's just getting started. I hope it'll you know, develop, get more interesting as it goes along. Oh, that is so cool. I, I cannot wait to, to dig into this whole experimental comics thing because that, that, uh, that's the tease. We're going to talk a little bit about experimental comics and the value of such a thing, uh, both as a, uh, an ex expression of fine art, but and then also like what can we glean from it as storytellers and as people who just want to enjoy comics better. Uh, but before we go into that, I should say... Uh, Matt Madden, you're kind of an Ann Arbor expat. Yes, that's right. I was uh, I did my undergraduate uh, uh, bachelor's degree at uh, University of Michigan in comparative literature, and then I worked in uh, Borders Store Number One back when it was still on State Street from uh, 1990 to about 1993. So yeah, I have a long history, and I was in Ann Arbor Film Co-op. So I was a pretty I was a bit of an Ann Arbor fixture for a while. Uh, also also a radio DJ at WCBN. Oh, wow. Back in the days there. Did they call it A2 back then as well? Sorry? Did they call it A2 back then as well? Or is uh, that a, a squared more commonly. Oh, okay. Nowadays it's always A2. The post office uh, sent out a notice and you couldn't put that as your, on your return address or when you're mailing stuff. You couldn't just put A squared. Uh, <laughs> Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Maybe it worked because it sounds like you don't, you're not familiar with this. Maybe, it's, uh, maybe the post office 
succeeded in in, uh, in squelching that back well, in the nineties. I don't know if it's if it's a, 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 a internet thing, but nowadays it's just a two a and then the number two. But yeah, because in in internet right. in website addresses you can't put you know the squared thing. But uh, maybe it's because of that. But nowadays I see everybody using that all the time. So, uh, but yeah. yes, so. Uh, you guys worked together, Matt and Matt. You guys worked together on a project uh, a long time ago. Yeah, back in the old five o'clock shadow days. How long ago was that? Yeah, well, more than that, say Matt is one Matt is one of the reasons I, I make comics, and he was probably he and Terry Laban, who's also a Ann Arbor expat, currently living in Philadelphia. Um, the two of them were, you know, really my my mentors that got me started making comics and learning about the world of mini comics. Um, and uh, the first, the, so Five O'clock Shadow, which I have some various copies of here, I'll hold up. I don't oh, have the original by one. Dean Williams. Uh, ah, there's Todd McMullen. That's right, yeah, Dylan Williams, Todd McMullen. Uh, I don't even know who that is. Here's one of mine. These are these are rarities for. Uh, wow. My work. Five O'clock Shadow number Here's three. There's a Sean Beery cup. Oh wow. So uh, I don't have the first one. The original issue was actually done by uh, just Matt and, and uh, Terry. And I believe you guys did it in preparation for the Chicago Comic Con. Is that right? Yeah, I wanted to put out a mini comic together. We called it Five O'Clock Shadow because we both needed a shave. <laughs> Is that really where the name came from? <laughs> That's where the name came from. Uh, sometimes the simplest is the best. Uh, so... So that that's how you got into comics, Matt Madden was uh, was through mini comics. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I, I, when I was in um, uh, at school in Ann Arbor, I was uh, starting to read comics a lot. I, but I just, you know, I didn't. I wasn't a huge comic fan as a kid. It was something I got into towards the end of uh, uh, boarding school in New Hampshire, and then you know, my time in Ann Arbor, I would just you know go to Dave's comic shop, which I think is gone now. And uh, places like the Don Treader, various used bookstores, and I'd scour the bins for old Zap comics. I once found uh, my greatest find story there is the old raw, you know, oversized raw magazines that Art Spiegelman and Francois Mouly did. They had a, the famous sixth or seventh issue is the, the torn again graphics issue. And the cover design was all like a torn up collage. And as a design conceit, they tore the corner off of every single issue of that print run, which is, you know, a couple thousand, and taped a different corner back on the inside. <laughs> and I bought that, I believe, at the Don Treader, another used bookstore, uh, who are usually pretty savvy about these things. But the guy took a look at it and he's like, I'll give it to you for 10 bucks because the... <laughs> wow. Wow, that's several. awesome. So that's the only early raw issue I have, and that's, and that's why. But, uh, yeah, so, I, you know, so I, I wasn't drawing comics at the time. I was just becoming really fascinated with them. Uh, I was studying literature, and I was getting really into film as well. And um, at some point, it was actually through... Uh, WCBN through doing the, my radio show, um, I approached Terry Laban to do a uh, to design a button for one of our fundraisers, and I went to visit him. He was living in Ann Arbor at the time, and he was doing uh, unsupervised existence as a mini comic. This was before he went on to be published by uh, I think Last Gas and then Venographics, uh, and is now doing web comics. But um, he showed me all these mini comics that he was doing. He told me about Matt's stuff. And uh, showed me Fact Sheet Five, this amazing old magazine, I remember that. which used to be that was like you know the internet in in monthly paper form that came in your mailbox, yeah. um, your your mailbox. And uh, and he told me that he and Matt would get together regularly and hang out and uh, drink coffee and and talk about comics and, and draw comics. Cafe and, espresso, uh, I think. Yeah, yeah, espresso royale. Espresso is, royale, yeah. Oh. First snobby cafe of, of Ann Arbor back then. <laughs> Sometime in, and Matt, you were living in Ypsilanti at the time. You'd go to your place with yep. the giant flowers out front and hang out there too. So that's how, that's what really got me kind of motivated to just like give this a try. And, and and you know, I didn't have any art training. I didn't go to art school. I didn't take any art classes my whole time in college. Um, but um, seeing these guys do it got me really inspired, and I decided to just you know start drawing and, and figure out as I, as I went, you know, how to do stuff. So I started, I did my, my first mini comics uh, in Ann Arbor, the first, first Five O'Clock Shadows with, uh, with Matt, and then I did a series called Terrifying Steamboat Stories, um, which you can try and track down somewhere, but I'm not planning to reprint most of that stuff, but that's how I got started. Wow, that is so 
awesome to think about, Matt, uh, Matt Fazell, because you do a lot of teaching in the Southeast Michigan area. You do a lot of, you know, showing people how easy it is to get into this medium through the mini comic, right? Yeah, I've got that How to Make a Mini Comic workshop that I usually uh, uh, run at libraries and, and grade schools and stuff. Right, right, and and you, you I want to talk about this later. But you really break it down into a system of of, of uh, you know how to think about it, a story visually, but uh, but also this idea of the you know something I say in a lot of my classes too is that the mini comic is the, the perfect jumping on point to getting involved in making comics because like when I when I work with teens I work with teens a lot and they're like oh I'm gonna do a graphic novel series and it's gonna be like Bleach it's gonna be 47 volumes it's gonna have all these different arcs and there's all these different characters that are gonna change and blah blah, blah. No. and yeah. eight pages that's all you need. <laughs> <laughs> and I say to them, that's awesome that you're so ambitious. That is so awesome. But, you know, you're 16. You know, you're, you're going to find out 50 pages in that you've gotten so much better at page 50 than you were at page one. That's going to be disheartening because you're going to want to go back and revise, right? And then, and then also there's that whole uh, the, the tunnel never ending kind of problem of working on such a big project. The mini comic yeah. is the perfect leaping on point because there's the satisfaction of completing a story, demonstrating that you can do it, and you're not changing as an artist that much per project. So Especially when you're 16, I mean, your your uh, attention focus is really limited. Yes, yes. you're gonna like uh, be interested in something else by the time you get to the third issue. So you might as well just like do an eight-page story, and it'll right. be awesome. Right. Yeah, well, so, go ahead, Matt. Yeah, no, I have the same experience. I mean, even with old, slightly older kids teaching at the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan, where I teach you know, undergrads, but the same same thing still applies. Where they all have these ideas of doing these massive, uh, you know, yeah, manga-inspired uh, epic stories that have these major, you know backstories and characters and, and uh, plot arcs and uh, you try to get them to do a one page story and they can't, they balk because they're like, well, I, I can't really tell the story in one page It's because I have to tell the story about the previous kingdom and how it was defeated. <laughs> and you're like, no, just forget the previous kingdom. Just up with the one, forget everything, all that stuff. And that's, and that's why to using uh, you know, constraints and, and rules are a good way to sort of break those habits because if you just tell someone um, all right, do a one-page comic that has uh, two humans and one animal, and it has to be a story about an exchange. That gives them a sort of you know starter kit that they have to work from. They have to sort of drop their other preconceptions mm -hmm. and uh, and and work with what they have at hand, and well, often surprise themselves. Yeah, yeah, and that, that's something that I talk about with my students all the time too. Is if I walk up to somebody on the street and say, "Tell me a story," they're gonna go, uh, 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 uh. but then if I say, "Tell me a story about your seventh birthday party." You know, and something good that happened or something bad that happened. And then suddenly by creating those limitations, they have a place to start from. Limitations. We did an episode of Comics Are Great actually not long ago called Limitations Breed Creativity. And we were talking about how um, putting artificial time restraints on a project can breed creativity. Sure. But, but man, oh, man. Um, I, I, I'm 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 fighting I'm fighting the urge to go there now. But first we got to you know establish your guys' credentials. So uh, for those who haven't heard of Matt Madden, yay! This book, Drawing Words and Writing Pictures, is... It's awesome. It is an awesome book, and it is one of... I mean, in a, in a world that we've lived in for so long where there were so many how-to-draw-comics books where it was like, this is how you draw a proportion. This is how you draw an exciting action pose. But it didn't really go into the semiotics kind of stuff and, like, how, you know, visual storytelling works. Those books rarely teach you how to be a storyteller, don't they? You know, mm -hmm. we had the cloud. You know, we had understanding comics, we had making comics. Uh, but what's great about this one is you, Matt, and, uh, Matt, Matt, and Jessica Abel broke it down into these wonderful, almost like a lesson plan, right? I mean, could you speak yeah. to that yeah. a little bit? Like, what, what was the thought process behind doing it this way? Uh, I mean, the model was basically uh, uh, almost like a language textbook, like teaching someone to speak a foreign language. Um, that's something I did for a long time, and I, and I really think of comics as... A kind of language you need to learn beyond just having the drawing skills. It's about what are the the you know general storytelling principles. Also, how do you put images and drawings into little boxes and arrange them in an order so that when you read them, uh, they make sense as a story. Uh, so, in that, and and on the other aspect is that there's so many uh, different levels of work involved in doing comics that you can't you can't just say have just sort of like one list of things to do. You have to be teaching. Storytelling. You're also thinking about design and composition. At the same time, we you know we have to be teaching about well, what size paper do you use? What what are the different kinds of pens? It's very technical stuff. Um, so it's more like film film video school than creative writing class in that way. 
um, that hey, you, have that, you really have to combine the art and the, and the craft and technology, um, or, or it doesn't really work, you know, usually. Yeah, there's even stretching exercises in there in the book. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, this book, you... you even some it, advice like, I learned from Matt Fazal, which is that uh, pretzels are the best uh, snack for cartoonists because they're not greasy. <laughs> <laughs> I not heard that one before. That's actually You're pretty good. With friends, judging comics or working on a 24-hour comic, you know, have a bowl of pretzels in the room and you know keep you keep you going. Yeah, better than don't, do don't do Cheetos, kid. <laughs> It'll ruin the art. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But uh, but I love orange. Did you hand tint all of those cover colors orange. Cheetos during the layout session. But so is it is it is it fair to say or is it uh, you know uh, reasonable to say that this is essentially uh, getting this book is like a full on course in making comics, right? Yeah, it's exactly. Yeah, and you can, and, yeah. and the great thing is, you can just follow. I mean, I hope this doesn't sound too much like a commercial, guys, but I mean, I am really excited about this book. I mean, Go you ahead, can, we'll stop rolling. <laughs> you get, you can zip back and forth between all the different lessons. I mean, one of the things that I think is really troubling. I mean, I've been teaching for about five years now, and one of the things I, I really struggle with is this idea of putting. Um, the making of comics into a linear progression because so much of it is you're zipping back and forth and it's like well people ask me do you start with the character do you start with the world do you start with an idea do you start with a premise well i start with all of them right and then you zip back and forth as you're developing each little piece and you're kind of intuitively figuring out how all these pieces kind of network together in a spider web way and to put it in a linear fashion like well first develop your characters and then develop your world and then develop your costumes you know that seems so artificial and misleading yeah, yeah. So, th by by, you've got this thing set up to where people can follow that more creative, kind of intuitive path of zipping back and forth to all the different points, and you get all these gentle reminders of maybe you should try sitting like this so as not to hurt your back uh, throughout right. the but book. It's designed to be as as, ply as as flexible as as possible as a teaching resource. And it's you know, its basic structure is a fifteen week semester. So if someone wants to teach a college class using this book as a textbook and really follow it as a week by week. Uh, syllabus, then it works that way. But it also works if you're just working on your own and you just want to, you know, if you've already done some comics and you just want to uh, dip into it or, you know, look up a particular thing in the index about how to use, like, the Ames lettering guide. There's, you know, one, yeah. it's just worth buying for that alone. That we, we have a very good tutorial on how to use the, the famous and, and uh, unjustly notorious Ames lettering guide. It's not that hard to use and it makes a big difference in your lettering. So, Right. Uh, and, and it's not it's not prescriptive or didactic, and I appreciate that as well. It, it, it leads to thinking exercises and thinking strategies and promoting a way of, 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 of investigating rather than I'm the teacher, you're the student, here, open up your brain, I'm going to fill it up with stuff right now, right? Right, so. right. Again, we're not trying to teach a specific kind of comics. Uh, again, comics is a language, and it, it has many dialects and many ways that it's used. So we're just trying to teach you the basic the grammar and the vocabulary and uh, let you decide what you want to say with it. And let's let's just reiterate, I want to underline this in black crayon. This book came out of a guy who found mini comics and said cool. Right? Is that not awesome? I mean yeah, they're, they're Jessica too. Yeah, Jessica too? the same awesome. background as well. She's herself and uh, started doing mini comics around the same time I, before I did. And uh, we both just, you know, figured out stuff as we went along and had friends like Matt and Terry LeBan who were older friends of ours who gave us advice along the way and taught us about different kinds of pens, you know, Terry was instrumental in getting, you know, he was the first guy who told me about the hallowed Windsor Newton Series 7, number two sable brush, that, you know, that everyone's supposed to use, uh, which I've since moved on from, but, uh, but, uh, but, you know, it was very piecemeal, and, we were, and it took us years and years and years to learn some very basic stuff, and so the whole point of this book is like, I mean, and that's fine, a lot of people still work that way, some people even prefer to figure this stuff out for themselves, but this book is intended to be a resource so you don't have to you know reinvent the wheel um, you know every, every kid who wants to learn how to do comics oh and, and good point bringing uh, reminding us about Jessica's involvement in this so the trick is to also marry a talented cartoonist and then be friends with Matt Fazell yeah and then, <laughs> that's the recipe <laughs> Uh, but, but you've taken this to the next level. Okay, so you got a new book coming out. We'll talk about that more a little bit later on. You got a, uh, Mastering Comics is the next book that you and Jessica are working on, right? But then you've got a yeah, website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, DW-WP, right, dot com. And this is going to be sort of like taking it to the next level of everything you did in, in the book, creating more resources for both artists and teachers, right? Yeah. Artists, uh, teachers, students, even just general comics readers. The 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 the, uh, the blog, which is the most active 
component of the website, although not the only one, um, has a lot of like general interest articles that are going to be you know stuff that's like you know if you're a cartoonist you'll learn something, but even if you're just like a fan, uh, you know you learn stuff about coloring, about layout, about uh, the creative process, and stuff like that. So it's it's uh, it's it's you know serves a lot of functions, and we're and it's a very much a work in progress and a constantly growing um, operation. Um, so there's the blog, there's uh, a, a whole book guide to the first book, and there will be one for the second book. There's a teacher guide and a student guide that gives you kind of like notes chapter to chapter. There's a lot of activities and materials on the website and more on the way that are not in the, either of the books. Um, so yeah, it's meant to be kind of a, a supplement to the books, but also really a, a resource on its own. Uh, I, th I imagine, I, I, f I know in fact that there are people who are using the website that don't even have the books, but they just, you know, are finding a lot of great stuff on there to use. I can attest that there's some amazing, amazing stuff on there. As somebody who has to develop lesson plans all the time for my classrooms, uh, yeah, I looked at that site and said, where have you been all my life? Or at least for the last five years of my life. Uh, so, okay, cool. So uh, now we got to turn to Matt Fizell and talk about what you're doing, because you, I mean, speaking of mini comics, right? Uh, we're turning Cynical Man into a movie. You're turning Cynical Man into a movie, and this is the this is this is a comics. What's it's, that? It's Matt kind of like comics because it's words and pictures. <laughs> Go ahead, Matt Madden. I was just say I'm very excited about this. Is this this is uh, news to me? So I'm eager to hear about it. Well, he, this is going to be a comics great. First, we actually have a trailer clip that we're going to be able to play. Now, Matt Madden, I don't think you're going to be able to see this when I play it, uh, but you can always watch it after the fact. It's going to be embedded in the episode. And, uh, yeah, the, the folks who are listening to the audio podcast afterwards, you'll hear the audio, but, yeah, you might want to check out the video. And it's going to be at uh, youtube.com slash comics great after the fact uh, and eventually on aadl.org. But uh, I'm going to try now to pull it up. So, so while I'm pulling it up, while I'm queuing up this clip, uh, Matt Fizell, uh, tell me about why make a movie. Well, um, uh, uh, I got involved with a little film group in Warren. About eight of us got together and we're um, making a feature film about vampires. And then when we got done with that, uh, one of the producers asked me, got an idea for another movie we can make? And I said, why, yes, I do. <laughs> and so I wrote this 94-page um, screenplay. No, it was 104 pages of a screenplay uh, about John Q. Cynical's first day at work. Okay, awesome. So now we're going to play the trailer. It's about two minutes long. And uh, switch to the, to the screen. Here we go. We'll this watch it now. also on cynicalman.com. Meet John Q. Cynical. He's just an ordinary guy with an ordinary life, and he drives an ordinary car. Name Cynical. John Q. Cynical. He thought he was looking for an ordinary job. I'm the best at what I do. My name is Edie. I know that. Instead, he got this one. Is there anything in here about weight and stupidity? No Fun Films presents Pizza Delivery for Dr. Queen. It's a little pop. You've invaded the secret hideout of Dr. Queen. I'd like to read you a new work. I call File of a Poet. Yes! What is it? It's, it's cynical, cynical Man! man. I'm an anti-social man. Thrilling tale of heroes, villains, love, no. friendship. Got break, huh? Oh, where do you come from? And zombies. <laughs> the rumors are true. There are zombies in ham traffic. Meet the Amazing Cynical Man, saving the world from 9 to 5. I'm the Amazing Cynical Man from the, the Board of Superheroes. Yeah, right. I never heard of you. A tale of workplace romance gone terribly wrong. I was one of the experiments. Starring an all-Michigan cast, made on location in the mean streets of Hamtramck, the town Detroit could not swallow. <laughs> We hit him fast and we hit him hard. You can do it, Jungle Man! Get in there and fight! Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and let's see if we get uh, Matt Madden back. Uh, so we got are you there, Matt? I'm back, yeah. I'm <laughs> tweeting us. I'm tweeting us right now. Oh, yes. cool. Point some people at the channel so they can watch this as it happens. Uh, so we got Sean Beery to be Lone Shark. Yep. 
and um, Suzanne Bauman to play Lizard Girl. And, uh, and they're both cartoonists. And uh, I did, I, did I see uh, Boardman in there? No. Boardman's not in the trailer. Okay. <laughs> so, but is he in the film? Well, yep. Oh, wow. Yeah, we got a styrofoam plank and we <laughs> dressed it up with a face and a hair and a big B on his chest. And uh, we got Scott McCloud to be the voice. Oh, really? Yes. Wow, that is awesome. Okay, so tell us about, I mean, we're talking about the, the board of superheroes, which you might want to show on camera there, and uh, the Cynical Man. Uh, for those who haven't heard of him yet, I mean, Cynical Man's been around a long time, but there might be somebody out there who hasn't heard of him. Yeah, I started Cynical Man back in the, the 1900s. It was the Carter administration, just before Reagan got elected. <laughs> and I was listening to a lot of... Uh, oh, hey, look yay! at this! <laughs> hey, check it out. I brought mine, too. Uh, I was just asking uh, Matt Fazell if uh, this was still in print and it apparently is not so ert this is a great collection if you can find it uh you should get it it's got a upc on it but i don't think it's got a an isbn isbn number but eclipse oh caliber comic caliber yeah you can still find it on amazon places yeah and i think all the pages are still appearing once a week uh on worldfamouscomics.com mm. they had them up there in rotation it's been there for years and years yeah i got mine signed too Cool. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, this has some of my favorite strips, like, uh, was it, like, Highways I Have Known? <laughs> <laughs> it's like... Uh, Sidewalks of Pam Tramick. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's going to be able to see this, but... A survey of the way different people shovel their sidewalks in Ham Tramick. <laughs> you go the snowblower, the late for work, the... Uh, when all else fails, the stampede. <laughs> But anyway, yes, so yes, you've been making comics a long time. Cynical Man has been a long, uh, you know, a long standing yeah. comics character. I started out doing the mini comics because I just love to publish my own stuff. I didn't want to wait for an editor or publisher to tell me it was okay to do comics. I just started drawing stick figure comics and kept doing it because it was fun and other people seemed to like it. So it kind of caught on. And now I'm pretty much stuck with it. I'm doing this, doing Cynical Man weekly as a, a newspaper comic in the local Hamtramck paper, the Hamtramck Review. And it's also published weekly at cynicalman.com. And what? So the last 10 years, 10, 12 years, it's been, I haven't been doing many, com I haven't been doing eight page stories. I've been doing like eight panel weekly gags. And okay. I'm trying to learn how to tell a joke. And that's, that's been a lot of real uh, uh, learning experience too. That's it. There's, that, that, that's talking about limitations, right? Yeah. Can we segue? Can we segue into talking about limitations and talking about experimenting through a limitation and finding Boy, out that, interesting things? Dividing up a page into a nine-panel grid was a real breakthrough for me. Was it? I, I was never as productive as <laughs> when I started limiting myself to nine panels to a page. <laughs> what do you, as, as opposed right. to? It's true. This is, uh, I was holding this one up earlier. I was just showing some uh, high school kids this strip last week, and it's called Nine Panels. And it's kind of a meta, like a lot of Matt's humor, it's sort of a meta humor kind of comic about the fact that it's nine panels. And it's, you know, it says, uh, here, you know, nine panels is the title. Here's a panel. Here's another one. It's page 39, going to read Jersey. All right. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is one of my favorites. He's driving a car with his patented rum uh, sound rum. effect. Um, this one's not bad either. I don't care for this one. It's just an empty house. A little action never hurts in Cynical Man <laughs> Tennis. A nature scene is nice. And then there's the one we've all been waiting for, the last panel, and this is the end. So it's kind of <laughs> like you know, the gag is all about the fact that you're timing yourself as you go through the, the nine panels of the, uh, uh, of the grid. And you that's really... You draw a grid and you start filling it in. I think that I did that in my sketchbook, mm -hmm. probably at the Cafe Royale. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll show you. Speaking of that, I'll show you another one from that same era that I also showed kids, which is another great example of a slight variation on it. And this one's just called uh, Coffee Cup. Um, I don't know how well this is showing up on the screen it there, looks but pretty good. It's, looks pretty good. You can see it, it's like, uh, and actually that's uh, a, a cup, a coffee cup being slowly drained. And I really think this, this is something that Matt pretty much invented, I think, this sort of like observational sketch comic. You know, it's like using that nine panel grid to parcel up um, sketches, you know, so you get, uh, I just realized my face looks really weird, you know, peeking in from the side of the book. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you know, it just shows the the pro, you know the, the time passing basically. It's really it's really lovely, kind of like a still life with with a bit of time element to it, uh, and it also features my left hand drawing in my sketchbook, so it has a special 
resonance for me. But, oh, but wow. yeah, the, I, you know, and, I, and I've, I've also uh, adopted that nine panel as my basic structure for all of my comics. Um, and probably, you know, partly because of Matt's uh, influence. You know, there's there's so many things that you guys are talking about here all at once uh, that I want to touch on. Is uh, you know, I just finished uh, a class for adults at the Ann Arbor District Library, and uh, these are adults who have never drawn a comic before, right? Uh, but they're interested in visual storytelling and they're telling stories. And one of the, the chief difficulties that uh, I run into with adult students, like getting them to understand uh, and and really accept and embrace, is how every panel, every page presents you with a thousand thousand choices. And we should talk about the ninety nine right. ways to tell a story in a second. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, and, and then you so you have to figure out how does this moment feel if, if, if it's not about a feeling then what is interesting to show like I think about cartoonists like Seth right uh, it's a good life if you don't weaken where he takes the time to show us a lot of different vantage points of a scene not to be uh, you know exciting but to be interesting what are some things that I notice when I'm walking around that I might want you to notice and when you look at that coffee cup comic that you did Matt and Fizzell uh, you're not just showing a static shot of the coffee cup slowly draining. You're showing a whole bunch of different ways to look at that scene too, right? Yeah. You're giving us a lot of different, you're giving us a sense of being there by looking around the area, right? 99 ways to look at coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Is that your new book? <laughs> the follow-up to Matt Madden's 99 ways to tell a story? Uh, we should talk about that. Like, what was 99 ways to tell a story? What was the inspiration for that? Uh, that's this book here, 99 ways to tell a story. Um, Came out in 2005, still easily available though, so uh, go out and sell, buy yourself a copy. Um, there's also a website, exerciseinstyle.com, where you can get a good sense of what we're talking about here. So if you can open up a separate tab and be uh, looking, checking this stuff out as we talk. The inspiration of this is actually a prose book from the late 40s by a French author named uh, Raymond Cano. He wrote a book called Exercise in Style, which is also the, the subtitle of my book. And he wrote a, a short anecdote, um, a, page, a page or so of text. And he retold this story 99 times. And he did it uh, using different uh, voices, like passive voice, doing it in the past tense, doing it uh, uh, you know, in different rhetorical voices. He also did it uh, using, telling the story backwards. He did it using all, you know, incorporating all the colors of the rainbow into the text. He did it as a haiku, as a sonnet. He did it in Pig Latin. He did it as a telegram. He does it, you know, so it gets increasingly absurd, and you know, all anagrams. So it gets some of them are completely gibberish, you know, but they're still based on this this base text. And um, I actually got this book when I was working at Borders in, in Ann Arbor many years ago, and uh, I right away I, I thought this would be a great idea to apply to comics because uh, you can do the same kind of basic story variations. With and writing variations in comics, you do have narration, you do have word balloons, you do have thought balloons. There's a lot you can do, and, but you also have sound effects and stuff you don't have usually in, in regular prose. Uh, although Cano does have an all interjections version, um, but you also have the drawing style, uh, which is a hugely you know variable and plastic element of comics. So that you can just you know whether it's realistic or distorted, whether you're channeling you know a particular uh, school of drawing like a certain manga style or uh, you know, heroic superhero style, underground comics, um, and uh, and and along with that, all the different kinds of like you know framing and things like that. Uh, and finally, uh, there's the the linguistic aspect of comics that how you put all these things together uh, in a grid, in a you know a nine panel grid, or in the in the case of um, the nine nine way style story, I, I came up with an eight pa eight panel page, and that's sort of my base unit, and all of the other um, examples try to vary that as slightly as possible. So here's like a monologue version of the story. So you'll notice it's the exact same panel layout. Um, the Harvey just Picard the, version, right? The Harvey, exactly, the Picard version. Here's a subjective view. So again, it's the same eight panels, the same dialogue, but it's only, you're seeing it now from the, the main character's point of view. Uh, First know. person, yeah. And, Visual stuff where it's like all sound effects in the dark um, to later on, you know, or Fumetti, Fumetti uh, <laughs> photo novella style. Uh, here's one that's a, always a fave. Oh, the manga one <laughs> with, with the gratuitous panty <laughs> shot. <laughs> gratuitous uh, upstairs shot, yeah. yeah. Although the, uh, the Jessica character is actually upstairs during the course of the story, so. Uh, so it's logical. That. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so the, the challenge there was how do you tell this kind of banal non-story about a guy going to a refrigerator and forgetting what he's looking for um, 
and, and keep it interesting and keep it find new things to do with it each time around. Um, and uh, so I, I took it on as a, a challenge to myself, as a creative challenge to see if I could do it. Um, and I had a feeling it was going to be, you know, hard but a lot of fun, which it was. Um, and uh, I also figured I'd do it and whatever, do it as a mini comic, maybe apply for a Xeric grant or something. But it got a lot of really good reaction from from the get go, and I've started serializing it online. And um, although I wouldn't really quite call it a, a web comic, but I you know, had a website for it, and eventually got a book deal. And the, you know, Penguin published the book back in 2005. Um, so it's still, you know, which made it very widely available, and I've had a lot of foreign editions, which has been really great and, and gratifying. Um, so I did it as creative work. I mean, of course, once I started showing it around, I realized that it was also a very good uh, primer in the language of, and style of comics. And I've, you know, definitely uh, visited a lot of schools and, and libraries and, and done talks to different groups of people, not just comics fans, but also, you know, I've been to a film class and uh, you know creative writing classes and talk to them about um, how these the, all these choices you're mentioning earlier just like the, the gazillions of choices because a big you know one of the reasons it's 99 is not a, a hundred for me is that 99 is a is an incomplete number and it suggests by the fact that you're using it that it's not definitive that you could keep on going because oh, um, nice. these are the 99 ways to tell a story these are just 99 that occurred to me and that I decided to take on you know you could just go on and on and on with this stuff curious uh you didn't, did you, well, I'll ask, I'll just ask the question uh, appropriately. Did you set out for this thing to be a teaching tool, or did you set out for it to be a work of art in and of itself? I set out for it to be a work of art in itself. That was really the main goal for me. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, ultimately, I, I hope that's how it'll be judged primarily. But, uh, but uh, you know, the more I showed it to people, the more I realized it really did have a very good, you know, educational Function and you know Cano's book, in fact, is, is still used today in a lot of creative writing classes. Uh, as, as, for the, as an example, the same kind of thing of how you can use different voices, different rhetorical strategies, different genres um, to give a different spin to, um, or, or to give you know to add meaning that's not even there just by virtue of uh, turning it into a science fiction comic. It's suddenly a different kind of story than if it's uh, a western, you know, or or just a regular uh, ordinary autobio story. So, uh, so I, I fully embrace the, the educational use of the book, um, I, you know, I, and you know, but I guess I do like as, as distinct from drawing words or writing pictures, which is a purely pedagogical work and is meant for education. I do hope that people, you know, remember and sort of step back and think, like, oh, it's you know, it's a work of art on its own right, and that's what what it is, you know, originally and, and finally for me. Right. I mean, that that's that kind of leads to something I want to talk about in terms of like justifying, or rather not justifying. That's an improper word. Uh, explaining experimental comics to people because okay comics is a pretty small niche world still unfortunately uh, but even within that world there are people who say hey it's just comics it's just funny books right and they're entitled to that opinion and then there's people who take it very seriously there's people like Scott McCloud who chart everything that they ever thought about in uh, in terms of comics uh, but th this experimental thing it is a work of art in its own right. It is avant-garde, and it is interesting for that reason. But if you don't even, if, if if for no other reason, it has a value because it's leading the way in terms of forward thinking for the medium itself, right? I mean, like by doing this thing just as a work of art, you created something that tr that teaches us, uh, whether you meant it or not, that uh, every story presents you with a million choices in every panel, and you can take something sure. as innocuous as going to get a glass of milk and make it suddenly a noir story. You know, I mean, th so I'm just pointing this out for anybody who's ever leveled a complaint against avant-garde or experimental works, right? Or even experimental activities, because I want to talk about that too, like experimental things that you do with your own work to, to jumpstart creativity. Like Matt Fizell, you said, Nine panels. Limiting yourself to nine panels is one of the greatest creative things you ever did. Explain. Uh, well, you... that, that and only drawing stick figures. You know? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> really. Another... Yeah, could you speak uh... to that? Well, it's it's um, it was certainly liberating for me when I started out. I, I thought I would have to be like Neil Adams or Jim Starlin or somebody to uh, <laughs> actually draw comics, and I would have to convince an editor to let me do that, and I had to draw for the editor or the publisher in, yeah. in some kind of house style. And um, the more I got into that, the more I realized, um, uh, no, there's like a zillion different ways to do this. And going back to stick figures was like a creative reboot because I, I, when I first started drawing comics in junior high, that's what I drew. Yeah. And that's when I had the most fun at it. So um, <clears throat> for me, it was about having the fun. 
Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Those of you who think that Matt only draws stick figures because that's all he knows how to draw should, you know, go back and look at some of the old uh, Anarchy comics. What, what, not, what issue number was that? Issue number three. You know, yeah. The, uh, this amazing, you know, just like a sort of a giant ant invasion story, right? If I yeah, remember correctly. It's, it's about um, ants really taking over a guy's ball, house. You know, three point perspective and we're very fully rendered and, and successful, uh, you know, horror comic. But I guess it was just took sap the fun out of it for you. And, and, uh, I think it's, it's kind of pretentious and insincere. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's also, I mean, another thing is it's just fun to think about this experimental stuff, too. But, it, it, but there is a, a, a practical benefit in your work, right, by limiting yourself that Yeah, way. when you have fun at it, it, it does show through your work. Yeah. And it, uh, it's, yeah. there's that, that spark in it that, that's not there when you're just trying to do it to impress uh, an editor or your girlfriend or... You know, try and um, an imagined audience. An or, imagined audience. Just yeah. do it for yourself, and and suddenly it's better. But but then yeah, playful. That aspect of play is very important. Very um, important. And keep maintaining that and not feeling like it's uh, a homework or something you have to do to uh, you know yeah pay the bills or or, or whatever. Um, although it's nice if it does. But I mean you know you keep that that sense of you're doing it because you love it and because it's fun and and, uh, and a challenge in a, in a rewarding way. But, you know, it's funny that you guys should bring up the spirit of play thing, because I think that uh, sometimes, like, the, the avant-garde or fine art or experimental work tends to uh, be uh, disassociated with that sense of playfulness in the minds of the general public, in the minds of the, the general, you know, reader or uh, comics creator, you know? They think, like, oh, this is highfalutin, this is artsy-fartsy, sure. these are people who are cocking their eyebrow and wearing a beret, you know? Uh, but but it's, it's, you're experimenting in the spirit of play, right? Well, the more you know about avant-garde, the more playful it does seem, That's you know? true, that's like, true. I'm sure Jackson Pollock that's had true. a great yeah. sense of humor, I, I think, right? I think what you're describing it definitely exists, but it's a very generalized preconception that people have about arty stuff as yeah. a whole. And, and yeah, Matt's right that, you know, anyone who uh, spends time actually reads some Samuel Beckett or listens to, you know, listens to some John Cage or just, you know, goes to see some art movies will realize that there's actually a lot of humor and playful stuff going on there. And it's, you know, it's just that it's not what you're used to. So it takes a bit more work to kind of figure out what's going on there or decide for yourself what's going on there. Um, and also, you know, there, there is work that's very, like, heavy and serious and, and sure. humorless. Well, some of which is great, some of which is pretentious. Um, but uh, they're, they're within, you know, avant-garde is not some monolithic thing. You know, there's, different, there's various ways to experiment and push boundaries. Uh, and I think Matt and I both in, in, in different ways and, and in similar ways embrace a very uh, playful uh, and, and open, you know, kind of experimentation uh, in our work. You know, one of the panels I really, or one of the pages I really love in uh, 99 Ways to Tell a Story, the, 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 a really great stellar example of uh, two ways to look at the same moment is when you do the, the page is one panel where it's, it's, it's you going to look for the thing in the fridge and forget what you're looking for and it's all told in one panel. But then just pages before, or maybe it's the page before, uh, it's told in 30 panels. And right, just right. showing that difference between compression and decompression in, in, a, in a comic story, too. So it's not just also in visual styles, but it's also in... Yeah, here we go. You got it up on the screen. I'll put this in the show notes, too. This is, uh, yeah, like one, you know, a one-page version of the story, and then the following page is a uh, 30-panel ah. version of the story. <laughs> I, always show this one, I always show this one when I do talks about this book or when I'm teaching about it, uh, because it, it, that's one of the most basic... You know, this comes back to the nine-panel grid idea. Like every time you sit down to do a comic, before you do anything, really, you need to think like, well, what size page am I going to work on? How many panels am I going to use in this page? Am I just going to start drawing and see where it goes, or am I going to give myself a grid? And if I do do a grid, is it going to be you know nine panels or six or you know or, or what? Uh, so all these choices are you know when you when you start listing them, it becomes quite overwhelming. I think to talk about, but uh, yeah. but you know. It becomes internalized, you know, you just do it automatically, I think, after a while. Um, but part of the experimentation like this is to, to, uh, to interrupt your, your normal process and, and question yourself at every point. Um, and that's something that's very rewarding, if sometimes exhausting to me, is just, sort of, you know, question, question myself each time I start a new comic. I, I don't really, I've never really settled into a standard style. Beyond, I'd say, the nine panel grid thing is something that I really use pretty, pretty regularly. But beyond that, I tend to use different materials, slightly different drawing styles, different uh, approaches to 
pacing and, and every story I do, you know, depending depending on what the the idea and the concept is, you know, is mm -hmm. it's behind it. What what are what are some of your guys' favorite limitations to work within? I mean, in terms of it can be either something that you do on the page, it could be something you do in a story, or it could be in the way that you execute something like the twenty four hour comic. Or Boy, like, deadlines are are yeah. real good help. <laughs> yeah, that's the best thing I get out of that newspaper strip is a weekly deadline. Yeah, I know it's yeah. got it's got to be like emailed into the paper a Thursday morning. How many you doing like a, a, a like a three to four panel strip? Uh, it's uh it's oh it's right there here you we know, go. Um, Usually an eight-panel grid. Okay, eight-panel grid. And um, I can make it into a six-panel grid or as many as ten panels. You might want to lift it up higher so the camera can see it. There we go. But yeah, yeah. So this is this is weekly. Yep. Every week. Comes come out hell every or high week. water. You have to come up with an idea. You got to come up with a story. You got to come up with something that's worth reading every week. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I think that's great. I, I don't think I could actually do that myself. That's not something mentally I'm capable of. But uh... taking this project on was was like challenging myself to see if I could do that because I wasn't sure if I yeah. could. And uh, I don't know how people do it daily. Yeah. <laughs> you must have a bunch of writers. I, I, uh, my I friend Tom Hart did it for several years for the, the Metro in, in New York and Boston. They did his Hutch Owen strip as a four or five panel, you know, daily strip five days a week for two or three years, I think. It's quite a while. Yeah. Did he write it all himself? Yeah. No, he wrote and drew everything every week. You know, he was just very, uh, you know, he you, you plan several weeks ahead, but <clears throat> for him it was just like a constantly invigorating. You know, it got can you know, he only stopped because it got canceled. I think he would have kept going otherwise, but because it was uh, for him it was exactly that having that weekly deadline. <clears throat> uh, but it also gives him a structure to work in any ideas that are just kind of floating around at the moment and go right into the strip. Has that um, an immediacy to it that uh, I know Tom really liked a lot. Um, a former student of yours, Matt Madden, uh, a friend of mine, Casey Van Heis of wintersandlavelle.com, uh, encouraged me to ask you about the comic Sestina, which okay. we'll, you want to talk about, uh, you want to talk about working within limitations and working within a structure. I mean, this is as structured as it gets, right? Right. So let's talk about a, a totally different idea of constraint. We're talking about like the page grid, the deadline, the drawing style, uh, another kind another sort of level of constraint is a, uh, applying a, a visual or narrative or, or design structure on, on a work. And something I've gotten really into, largely because of doing 99 Ways to, to Tell a Story, is uh, using structures that come from, from poetry, uh, like the sonnet, like a haiku is a kind of structure. You, know, you can imagine, for example, doing, how would you do a haiku comic? There's not really an obvious way you do it. You could do uh, the, uh, you know, five panels and seven and then five. Is that right or did I get that reversed? Uh, or you could you know, do it related to the size of the panels in relation to each other. There are various ways you could do it. <clears throat> so the uh, Sistina is a very complicated uh, in, you know, French poetry form from the troubadours from the Middle Ages that doesn't have rhymes at the end of each panel. It has uh, repeating words called repetants. So I, and I love the idea of repetition. Comics is based on repetition anyway. You're always redrawing stuff, and you've got this rhythm to it. So I like the idea of, I always like seeing images recur, and even you know, exact panels. So I use that idea as a structure for, for a story, and not just a poem. So it you know, involved this very long process of coming up with some images and arranging them in this you know, rotating sequence, and then kind of working backwards from that to try and fi find a story in there somewhere. Um, <clears throat> you asked earlier about you know what what it is that we get why we do this experimentation and what we get out of it is it just for fun it is for fun but <clears throat> when it comes down to it for me it's really about uh, surprising myself with my own creative work trying to come up with something that um, I would never just come up with just by sitting down on a blank piece of paper and starting to draw um, the more you give yourself these are you know arbitrary very strange barriers and that you know definitely includes the you know the uh, uh, what kind of regular grid you use and whatnot um, but telling yourself it has to have these you know six panels that repeat every page in a different order um, you can't help you can't just decide well I'm gonna do a story about a guy who goes on a voyage and then he's gonna meet this girl and they fall in love and they do a bank heist you have to make everything fit this existing structure I mean you can try that but it has to fit the structure that's there and, uh, and often it takes you in directions you never would have expected uh, and never would have come out of your work otherwise. Yeah. That's what it is for me. It's, like, it's surprising myself. And uh, in the same way that you know, uh, 
surrealism is about finding, you know, accessing your, your unconscious. I didn't really find that approach work for me very well, like, you know, doing stuff for my dreams or things like that, which I did in some of my earlier mini comics. But giving myself these, these rules and, and mathematical, you know, uh, systems to follow in a weird way gets to even more lunatic fringes than, than uh, a lot of surrealist stuff. Um, no, yeah, yeah I, I, I ran into this myself with, uh, I used to do a monthly experiment with my wife where we would sit down once a month and we would grab, uh, we'd have a six panel grid and we would grab uh, headlines from the New York Times from December mm -hmm. 12th and we cut out just the headlines and then we would grab random, we got like all sorts of like, you know, get you goo doodads like toys all around the house because we're nerds, but um and we put them in a bag and we randomly select three objects in the bag, three headlines, just the headlines, not the stories. And then we yeah. have to, in two hours, pencil, ink, and color a full story within right. those six panels. And I'm a guy who... What's that? I said, that's excellent. I love it. Carry on. <laughs> oh, I'm glad. Uh, and, and, and usually a bottle of bourbon is involved as well in order to like get us through the, the, the scary parts. Because usually that first panel, I'm just stricken with terror. Because I how am I going to do this? How am I going to meet this deadline? i got to beat this thing. Um, but I'm a guy who special, or I've, I've made my career out of doing stories for young people. I really like doing stories for kids and stories that are good for kids. But when I did this experiment, all of a sudden, all my stories had these really bleak and dark endings that I oh. never would have thought that were inside of me. I, I, one story ended with a guy on the moon, his uh, fellow astronaut is slowly going insane, his oxygen is at 20%, and he knows he's never going to get home, and he's walking outside onto the surface, and it's this bleak looking up at the earth, you know, I'm never going to get back there. And I thought, where, where did that come from? I thought I was a cheerful guy, you know? So you find out, the, the, the neat thing that we discovered through this is just through the desperation of meeting the deadline and fitting within the parameters of the experiment, you find out new things about yourself as a storyteller, you find out new storytelling moments, you find out new ways to cheat, to get through it, to meet your deadline. You know, it's it's an incredibly rewarding experience. And then we also had little books. That we wound up printing them up as uh, matchbook size comics that we sell at shows. We're going to be at SPX this year. We'll sell them there. So, but anyway. You guys should have kids. <laughs> you think so? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you should come over sometime, uh, Matt Fazell, to do it with us. That would be fun. Oh, sure. Do another yeah. one of these experimental comics. Yeah, I'll bring my wife. Okay, cool. <laughs> awesome. All right. It sounds like a great structure. That's like, if I, if I do imagine doing some kind of regular strip, it would have to have some kind of regular structure like that, like a kit that I draw from each time. And that's, you know, uh, I, I sort of think about doing like a, a series of one-page comics, not necessarily the weekly thing, but it would have to be something along those lines. Take a headline from the newspaper, take a random photo off of Google, yeah. take a keyword, you know, and, and, take, and, and, uh, and give yourself that starting point. Otherwise, I'm lost. I can't just, you know... <laughs> whip out a blank piece of paper and just start writing something funny every week. But going back to like, you know, how the general public or like a general population might respond to something like this is like there's always this attitude of, oh, well, you're taking the creativity out of it because you're limiting everything. I mean, true creativity is letting yourself go and just express yourself what's inside of you. Uh, but here's, a, I want to pull this quote from, from your website, uh, Matt Madden. Uh, this was from, I think, um, Oh, goodness sakes. It was from the 99 Ways to Tell a Story website, which is exercisesinstyle.com, where you say, you know, for what are the sonnets and other rigorous poetic structures, if not constraints, which, which challenge a writer to master them, right? Good quote. I think so. And that's why, that's why I copied and pasted it. <laughs> I'm going to hang out of that one. But yeah. Okay. Um, you want to you wanna talk about uh, Uba Po for a second? Yeah, well, uh, Uba Po is the name of a... Uh, uh, a French group of cartoonists. Um, it's a acronym for Ouvoir de la Bande Dessinée Potentielle, which translates to Workshop or Potential Comics. And uh, Raymond Cano, the guy who inspired me to do Exercise in Style, also founded an experimental writing group in the 60s uh, called Workshop for Potential Literature, ULIPO. And uh, they basically, their, their goal is to kind of catalog and play around with just the kind of stuff we're talking about constraints, rules that you can use to generate. Um, prose, poetry, and in our case, comics. So, um, Ubapo was founded in the early 90s. I wasn't aware of it until it was already underway, and I independently started working on my exercise and style. And um, they uh, meet somewhat regularly and have done various projects and books, uh, and they're mainly centered around the French publisher, uh, L'Association. Um, so, this is one of their collected books, they're called the you know, opuses, but with a U, opus. Um, so this is the opus four. It collects various actually jam comics that were done at a couple of comics conventions. Wait, so how it, thick is that? 
How I'm thick? Is, how thick is that book? That's a thick book. Yeah, it's uh, holy, holy moly. But these are this is the result of various jam comics from different um, conventions for, uh, over the course of you know a year, uh, a couple of days actually, three days, uh, and about fifty cartoonists collaborating on these jam comics, which have they're not just uh, the usual jam comic, which is uh, you know someone draws the first panel and hands it on to the next person and so on. Um, these jams have rules to them, which I think is a great uh, idea. Um, We're still doing monthly comics know, jams at Green Brain. There's a diagram. Yeah, exactly. There's a diagram here explaining. There's something I can't remember how it is, but there's something where like each artist does two panels, and then maybe they get reversed or something like that. So, oh wow! There, uh, you know, there's a there's a there's an anagram kind of aspect to it there. Um, so yeah, a couple of years ago I was in Detroit and Jessica and I did a, a jam comics night at Green Rain uh, comic book store. And so we had a, a list of, of rules for jam comics. And again, starting from a nine panel grid that we just hand out a blank sheet of paper. And instead of just doing one panel to the next panel and sort of making it up as you go along, every, person, every participant in the jam has to choose a rule that their jam is going to follow. So it might be, uh, you know, every, every panel has to include one monosyllabic word for uh, every, uh, the story, the, the comic has to be told backwards. So you start with the last panel and then the next person has to fill in the second to last panel and so on, telling the story in reverse, ending up with the beginning of the story. Wow. Uh, stuff like that. Uh, and it's a way, again, to structure, to give some, something to wrestle with creatively uh, rather than just kind of, you know, if you just do story after story, they tend to be very funny or panel after panel. Uh, and usually, you know, pretty pretty crude. But in the end, they're not very interesting to read. They're more fun to do than to read. And when you have more of a, a kind of guiding structure to it, I find it leads to a bit more interesting end products uh, because there's there's more uh, there's more meat to wrestle with there. Mm. So that's at uh, tomhart.net slash ubapo. That's o u b a p o, right? Right. So you'll find uh, a lot of examples of what I'm talking about there and a list of, of uh, these kinds of rules and constraints that uh, Ubapo came up with in their first yeah, publication. There's, there's, yeah, there's full-on experiments that you can try on there, right? I mean, if I remember, oh, yeah. yeah. So I'm just yeah, saying... I mean, the, point, the point of the group is it's not a, uh, a group that like creates work and sends it out in the world as much as it's a group that documents, and this is true of the literary group too, they, they're really trying to just compile and document as many... Uh, ideas for you know cool rules for making comics like doing a, a palindrome comic or doing a comic using all the letters of the alphabet uh, and so on um, and uh, and the idea is that they're there for everyone to use so I came up with a constraint called alphabet city where it's a, a panel a comic that is 26 panels long and each panel has to include uh, the corresponding letter of the alphabet so the first panel is a second panel is B and you kind of incorporate it visually as well as in the text I did a story called The Prisoner of Zembla, uh, which I think is online somewhere. Um, the, the, the flash version on, on the Ubapo site is not working. But a bunch of people ended up doing this. Sarah Varon, Dave Lasky, uh, Roger Langridge is on there. Oh, wow. Um, so I just kind of sent out an email to everyone saying, you know, this is an idea I came up with for a way you could structure a comic. So have at it. And people did great stuff. And, you know, like Lasky combined it. He'd also been invited to do a story for a zombie themed anthology so he did a zombie alphabetical story and because zombies are kind of about the end of the world he had a, the alphabet run backwards so it starts with z <laughs> and up with a. so it's an amazing comic actually uh, that's on the Ubapo uh, site which you can find yeah through the Tom Hart's website or also through uh, on my blog if there's a link to it as well so yeah and we'll link to it in the show notes as well for this episode so Wow, wow, lots and lots of cool stuff. This was a really good one, and I know that we only just kind of skimmed across the top. There's a lot more deeper we could go with this stuff, but we're coming up on the end of the episode, and I want to get time to talk about uh, stuff that you guys are doing that you want to make mention of and plug. Um, so what's next, Matt Madden? Uh, Mastering Comics. What's this going to be? I guess something to yeah, do with so Yeah. Mastering Comics is the follow-up to drawing words and writing pictures, and it's... Uh, the same size, same format, and it builds on what we did in the first book. It you know reviews and goes deeper and stuff about inking, especially adds a bunch of new uh, concepts like perspective that we didn't really have have time to get into in the first book. Uh, more stuff about storytelling and coming up with ideas. There's a whole section on using creative constraints, but also writing from uh, personal experience, you know, autobiography and memoir, 
uh, writing from you know creating characters, writing from from themes. You know, work like think about Jason Lutz's book Berlin. You know, it's, it's not really so much character or constraint based as much as he's like I wanted to explore what Weimar you know Germany was like, and and that's really the the germ of that whole work. Um, we talk about colors. There's a color section in this one, which is something that a lot of people were disappointed wasn't in the first book. So you're going to get it. Um, and so that'll be coming out in the spring of 2012. It's in the copy edit stage right now. I'm afraid I don't have. We don't. Some sometime soon we'll be uh, unveiling a cover design on on the website. But certainly keep keep posted on uh, dw-wp.com for that. Um, I wish I could say I have a book of my own coming out soon. But I, I have the the woods transmissions and other stuff on my blog. I've been slowly serializing things and we'll have some mini comics ready at some point. Um, Jessica, we haven't talked about the best American comics, but that's another project uh, Jessica, Abel, and I are the series editors of, and the new one will be coming out in September. Alison Bechtel is the uh, guest editor, and this is an amazing cover by Jillian Tamaki. That's amazing. Um, yeah. Who is and publishing that, that, Matt? I'm sorry? Who is publishing that? That's Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. Okay. So if you haven't seen that, you know, that's the, it's part of like the Best American series that goes back to the 20s, Best American Short Stories, Best American Essays, Best American Travel Writing, and so on. And they've been doing a comics uh, version. This will be, I think, the sixth volume they've done. So it's great. And Jessica and I have been the series editors for the last four. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is a translation I did from French of a wonderful book called The Zabim Sisters by a French, uh, a deceased French author named uh, Aristophan. One, one name uh, artist and it's published by first second it came out last fall and it's got a lot of good recognition it got a couple of like uh, young adult uh, reading commendations from the uh, from librarians and stuff like that but um, it's you know he, it's a, one of my favorite comics ever and I'm very pleased to be able to uh, translate it and bring it to the English speaking public and that's something I'll, I'll be doing more translation in, in the years to come that's Cool. Um, any public speaking appearances or convention appearances that you want to make any noise about? Let's see. Well, coming up in the fall, uh, Jessica and I are going to be doing a, a comics book club at the Brooklyn Public Library. Uh, oh. Central Brooklyn. So anyone, if there are any New Yorkers uh, watching this uh, now or later, um, we're going to be reading Fun Home and uh, Asterius Polyp uh, by David Mazzucchelli. Uh, um, Lucille, a really interesting new friend, well, actually not new, but newly published uh, French graphic novel by uh, Ludovic de Berme from Top Shelf. And what's our fourth one? Jessica's in the background there. I forget what our fourth book is. Um, I'm going to be down in, uh, in Medellin in Armenia, Colombia in September for uh, Entre Vignetas, their second ever comic convention in Colombia. I'm very excited about that. And uh, we'll be at the New York Comic Con, the two of us, probably on a panel. Uh, Jessica's going to be at SPX doing a panel. And uh, yes. two panels. Um, and yeah, so we'll, we'll be around. So, and again, we always post stuff. Oh, I should also say, follow me on Twitter at M Madden comics. Um, I'm also on Facebook and also on Google plus. So I'm, and I tend to post there pretty frequently. And so there's a good way to keep track with, with, uh, what I'm doing, what's going on with the best American comics and what's going on with the drawing words and writing pictures stuff. We'll link to all those social network, uh, links to you on, on the show notes for this episode. Okay, cool. Well, then, I'll, I'll look forward to seeing Jessica at SPX. I'll, I'll have to check out her, her panels. Um, yeah, I wanted to get your, those mini-comics from you, the matchbook ones. Okay, <laughs> I'll bring some. I'll bring some to, to drop off. Yeah. Uh, so, cool. Book club. That is, that is an awesome thing that is growing, because I know, Matt Fizell, you, you started a book club uh, in the... Oh, you... the Graphic Novel Reading Club. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, tell, tell us about that. Um, that was uh, Sean Beery's brainstorm, actually. He's okay. one of the founding fathers of Dr. Sketchy Detroit mm -hmm. and uh, wanted to start a graphic novel reading club. And we met for like um, twice. I don't, I don't know when the next meeting is going to be, but I think we read um, uh, Charles Burns's book. Black Hole? Black oh. Hole. Yeah. Oh, that was creepy. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have anything good to say about that. <laughs> it is a very dark book. <laughs> What were you going to say, Matt? Man? Were you meeting at this in like in a cafe or someone's house or what? Uh, first time we met at a, um, a bookstore in Detroit, Leopold's, and the second time we met at the uh, um, Hamtramck Public Library. Oh, and there was a time Ooh. before that where we read uh, Crumb's Genesis. Oh, awesome. We met at Leopold's to discuss that, too. See, that's something that I'd love to start up in the Ann Arbor area, yeah, too. Yeah, Graphic um, Novel Reading Club. Graphic Novel Reading Club. And getting back to the, uh, the idea of education, it's, it's not, it's, you know, like any reading club, it's about learning 
you know, getting more out of the reading experience. But I think with comics especially, there are so many people out there who are comics curious, you know, who mm -hmm. haven't, are not really into comics, they feel like they don't, and possibly don't really know how to read them, you know, oh, full richness. Yeah, yeah so no, I... I we're very much sort of spinning this book club at the, at the library is, you know, I'm, I'm sure we'll get comics fans, and I hope we do, but I, what I really want to get is like general readers in who have been sort of afraid to dive into comics and get them to come in and, and sort of, you know, we're going to have uh, kind of a slideshow aspect too and we can talk about like look at how this page design or like, the, you know, even how like Alison Bechtel uses, you know, the, the blue tone in Fun Home, how does she use that as a storytelling element, how does yeah. she use kind of aspects of deep focus, how does the text interact with the images. Um, so really teach people how to read comics as well as just, you know, that particular book we're talking about. And, and I know, and I agree. I think people do need to be taught how to read comics, uh, especially adults who haven't read them in a long time. Uh, I did a two-day workshop at the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts, teaching sure. teachers how to use comics in the classroom to teach curriculum-based content. And so, you know, John F. Kennedy Center, you think this is like really, uh, this is the elite of the teachers, right? These are like the really plugged-in teachers who really are invested in and want to uh, pursue this stuff. But even they, when I was showing them some really uh, ambitious layouts by uh, Ernie Cologne, uh, one of the teachers stopped and she said, why is he doing this to me? Those were her words. Why is he? <laughs> I should start with Nancy. <laughs> well, I did. I... <laughs> something that's easier to read than to not read. Well, it, the, the, whole, the whole section of that lesson was to talk about how you can have ambiguous reading sequences in comics, and that's one of the powers of it, how it employs the rules of art as well as literature and all that stuff. But, uh, but that was the point where she was feeling so threatened by what she saw because she didn't know where to go next that she said, why is he doing this to me? Like the, the yeah. author. So... You know, I, I do think that book clubs are absolutely necessary for th what, you know, Matt Madden was talking about there is this idea of, uh, you know, educating the general public on how this, this medium works, right? Yeah. Not just getting them to appreciate it more, but also making them better readers of the medium, right? And if you, even if you get a bunch of kids yeah. that are just uh, read Green Lantern and Superman, yeah, yeah you're, you're going to get them to discuss, why is this better than Green Lantern? <laughs> 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 And they'll, you know, they'll, they'll yeah. learn something from it. Yes. Well, certainly, it, it does. It gets some reading, and you know, it gets some reading and talking. I mean, it definitely. I, I feel like the the literacy tool aspect of comics gets a bit oversold sometimes because, uh, well, it, it's but it is it's great that you know reluctant readers, especially young boys, you can get them into libraries and reading um, mm -hmm. if they know they can read superhero comics. It's fantastic and, and, and manga and, and whatever. But uh, it's important to remember that these. It's also you want to impress on the teachers and the parents, the librarian. The librarians certainly already get it that it's a literary form, you know, and it's not just something that's a gateway to getting the kids to read real books, but that a comic is a real book. Right. Uh, and even if they're reading superhero comics, if they're getting a rich dialogue out of it, then great, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually they'll read more, they'll, they'll branch into uh, reading fiction and reading more complex comics and, and so on. Right. So, uh, yes, literacy tool, but also remember that comics are an art form and should be you know, yeah. appreciated. They're awesome in and of themselves, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, Comics are great, you might say. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, what else? What else you got, Matt? You're going to be doing uh, a showing of. Uh, you're going to be talking about the Cynical Man movie. Uh, yeah, here at the Ann Arbor Library, we're doing a chalk talk about um, how to turn uh, your mini comic into a movie. <laughs> wow. Uh, well, September thirtieth, the day before. The hmm? there. Yeah. Mini comics into movies. <laughs> <laughs> that is the next step. That's what we need more of. Uh, mini comics made into independent films with uh, all local casts, like the Cynical Man. Yeah, all, you know, shoot it in your hometown. I'm waiting for the uh, Roy Tompkins Harvey the Hillbilly Bastard, Hillbilly Bastard to be uh, turned into a movie. Then that would like a great feature film. <laughs> So that's September 20th. You're going to be doing a talk on that. 30th. Uh, 30th. 30th. Right. September 30th, 2011. We will put that a link to that in the show notes as well. Uh, and then you've got another workshop coming up in Plymouth. In Plymouth, uh, October 20th at the Plymouth Library. How to make a mini comic. How to make a mini comic. And you're going to come to the mini comic workshop and make an eight page mini comic in 90 minutes. Wow. And you actually complete it. You break it down into a very nice system for people, right? That's the right, the yeah. five things everybody needs to have in a comic story. Is uh huh. It? The five things, uh, and you start with a panel border and you go through to the end. I've, I've, I've witnessed this workshop. It's an amazing workshop. It, it, not, not a single person uh, hesitates to draw. You, 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 both in your presence and in the way the content is organized, is such an approachable way that even if somebody is absolutely terrified to draw, usually they walk out with a finished thing afterwards. It's pretty yeah, amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it is yeah. pretty cool. You did this at the Ann Arbor District Library over the summer. I think you 35, 40 kids? Yeah. It was 
Wow, that was awesome. Almost every one of them finished comic. <laughs> the so ones that didn't said they were going to take it home and finish it at home. I can't, mm -hmm. wait, I can't wait to see the books that these kids create because of the class that they took from you. So, you know. Oh, wow. Just the Johnny Appleseed of comics. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. That's right. uh, one thing I've always loved that Matt does at conventions is that he has a wall behind him, and he does a, a thing of Post-it notes. And anyone who walks up and draws a cynical man, he's still doing this, Matt. I still do that. And stick it on the wall and give him a free mini comic. And so at the end of the show, you get this giant wall of uh, cynical man drawings by you know little kids and you know famous comics pros alike. Uh, I, I love and, but that. They all, they all look very different, and none of them look quite like the original cynical man. You can always tell the Matt cynical man somehow. <laughs> so, but then it's also like a one day installation. At shows, yep, yeah. comes down at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah, that's right. pretty cool. And it, it's not only an art installation, but it also reverses this idea of getting the original art from the artist. Like, I want your art. You know, you're a participant in this yeah. thing. Oh, now you're a guest artist here. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I absolutely adore your ethos, Matt. You, you have, a, you have a really, really great uh, spirit about about the this medium, and that's probably why you've yeah. inspired so many people. So, that's true. Okay, well, we're going to close, uh, we're going to wrap up, and uh, we're going to close the video with a cl another clip that you brought for us, Matt Fizell. Oh, uh, yeah, that 40-second uh, clip from the movie. Yes, from the movie, where you had to do, a, like, a whole lot of post-production work, a lot of special effects yeah, it's work. It's like, um... Wait, Matt, are you appearing in the movie? Are we going to get some Matt Fizell screen time in this thing? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm an extra in there twice. I'm a protester, and I'm all, <laughs> I also play dad at Mom and Dad's boarding house. Oh, uh, good, yeah, that's good. Awesome. And so, yeah, we actually had a cast picture here. Did we show this earlier? But I think this, we were showing it before we were started recording. So then you actually you so see the, Boardman in there. The clip I brought is uh, uh, 40 seconds. It's got 12 shots and three special effects. And um, the storyboards kind of look like this. I went through and drew the whole movie before, wow. I, um, before I actually started directing it. And it went on for about 400 pages like this. Oh, my goodness. And... Uh, then we shot it, and then now we're editing it and doing all the special effects and stuff. And I'm learning how to use what I learned at, at, in Photoshop at newspapers and ad agencies to um, make movie special effects now. You can composite different images together and make it into a story. Wow. Awesome. So that'll be something we can look forward to at the Ann Arbor District Library when you come to talk to us. Yeah. We're going to awesome. show more of it. Cool. Okay. Well, then I'm going to close out. Thank you guys so much for this conversation. This was really, ah, oh, this was, I'm going to go home and I'm going to draw like a million pages. I'm so fired up. Yeah, now, so. me too. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, and, and I, I, oh yeah, well, I hope to have you guys back in the near future. Um, but uh, yes, uh, Matt Madden can be found at mattmadden.com, mattmadden.blogspot.com, uh, dw-wp.com. And we'll have links to all your social media in the, uh, in the show notes. And Matt Fizell? Cynicalman.com, and uh, there's a Cynical Man page on Facebook, and awesome. also the Cynical Man fan club you can ask to join. Oh, cool. All right. Well, we'll put links to that in the show notes as well. So uh, thanks again, guys, for the great conversation. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Adam, see yeah. you. I hear you. I can't see you, actually. Hey, well, we'll, we are. we'll let you guys talk to each other in a few seconds over Skype when we wrap up. And I'm going to ask the guys who are running the, the boards to keep the stream going while we play the clip in a second. Uh, but until next time, everybody, I've been Jersey Drozd of ComicsGreat.com and Jersey on the Twitters. And okay, thanks. Goodbye. <laughs> Look. There in the sky. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? It's, it's Cynical, Cynical Man. Man.